Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so let's continue. So this is a truncated kernel. So uh, recall yesterday we had the trace formula for the co-compact uh, co uh, co case in which we had gamma was a discrete subgroup of, uh, of, of a group H. And uh, we had the formula that uh, if you sum over all gamma in the conjugacy classes of gamma of A gamma H of gamma uh, F H gamma, this is the geometric side, it's a sum over pi of the multiplicities of pi in the right regular representation times the trace. So here this is the trace of pi of f. This is the multiplicity of pi. And uh, this is the volume term. Uh, and this is the orbital integral. So h mod h gamma. So we saw this last time. Now uh, I would like to make one uh, remark here. Uh, the remark is that if uh, these, the distributions that occur here are what is known as invariant in the following sense. So, uh, so these distributions are invariant. Meaning, if, you, if I change f, replace f with fy, you get the same distribution, where if you have uh, fy of x is conjugation of f with y, so this is y x y inverse, so y in the group H. So uh, these these distributions, these and this f h and f gamma, this geometric side and spectral side, they are invariant. And one way to see them is that trace is invariant under conjugation. And here you make a change of variables and you use the conjugacy class, the, you fix a conjugacy class. So the proof is it's, it's, it's not so difficult. So yeah, so this is one observation here. And now let's, uh, so yesterday we made all the preparations to define the truncated kernel. Now let's define the truncated kernel. And from that definition, we will first we'll prove that it's. I mean, we won't prove, but we'll have a feeling of what the kernel is. We'll prove that, look at that it's absolutely convergent. Tell a few properties about the kernel, and then make the geometric expansion as well as the spectral expansion out of that truncated kernel expression. Okay, so. So Arthur defines this. Uh, truncated kernel for T in A naught sufficiently regular which means it is away from the walls of the uh, in a, walls in A naught and he defines uh, KT XF as a sum over standard parabolic P it's an alternating sum of uh, delta in GQ mod PQ of uh, KP delta X delta X times some characteristic function. So this, this takes values either one or zero and it's an alternating sum and the, the speciality of this is that in a compact neighborhood of the identity, it agrees with the, the old kernel we had. So here, let, let's recall the K, definition of KP. KP is the kernel of the right regular representation, uh, induced, induced right regular representation. And RP is
so the trivial representation on NP and the right regular representation of on MP. And explicitly it is given by this formula KPXY integral NPA summation MPQ. Tn. So imagine what happens when p equal to g. There's no unipotent radical because g is uh, reductive. So it's the sum of f of x inverse uh, gamma y, which was the old kernel. So when k p is g, you get the old kernel. So, so uh, yeah. So what happens for in the case of SL2? So in the case of SL2, you have two standard parabolics. So SL2, you get KTXF is KXX minus you get just one term, and that is K0 delta X delta X times tau 0 hat A0 delta X minus T. So you, it's a difference. So K you're subtracting something from K. That's the definition. So now uh, Arthur proves a couple of things. So first of all, Arthur proves that this expression here is when you integrate it over a G, you get something that is absolutely convergent. So Arthur proves so the expression for J T of F as integral. This is a finite volume space, KTXF dx is absolutely convergent. So, so this, and moreover, he gives properties about this JT. He shows that uh, this is a polynomial in T. So. So uh, the map T going to JTF is a polynomial in T. So initially you have this defined for T sufficiently regular. So now you can just define it anywhere you want. But then uh, Arthur says there is a canonical way to, to define a uh, what point you want in A naught, and uh, so uh, so what he says is uh, so choose t in A naught. So there is a unique t naught in A naught such that the distribution uh, so the J t of f or t naught when I plug in t naught it is independent of which minimal parabolic you choose. Uh, containing M naught. So uh, your M naught is the levy of P naught. Fix that M naught. Okay. There are many parabolics. I mean, cardinality of the wild group, many parabolic subgroups, which have the same levy. Okay. So once you fix M naught, and if you fix T naught, it doesn't matter which P naught you choose. They are conjugates up to the wild group. Okay. So that becomes invariant under this. That is one property. Okay, so for SL2, for example, or GLN, uh, this uh, T naught is just the origin. Okay, so no surprises there. And uh, the third property Arthur proves is that uh, uh, so yeah, so so basically the third property is that uh, KT X if Arthur gets uh, geometric and spectral expansion out of it. So this O, I will define very shortly what this O is and uh, maybe in the next lecture or so. Uh, and this is, these are the conjugacy classes in, I haven't defined these objects, but he gets the spectral and geometric expansions out of it. So this, such an expression is called the coarse uh, expansion and uh, 
Arthur makes terms more explicit after, when he develops the fine expansion from the coarse expansion. So we will see that at least for SL2, but this is, uh, this is what happens. Uh, yeah. So now let us see, uh, some, let us do some analysis with uh, the SL2, in the SL2 case, okay. So this is SL2. So recall that K, we chose the maximal compact subgroup as SO2R at the infinity place times SL2ZP at the finite places. This is the maximal compact subgroup. And so you have this double coset GA mod GQ mod K. And then you write this as uh, G is SL2. So this is uh, SL2Z mod SL2. So SL2Z, SL2R mod uh, SO2. Okay. And so this can be identified. So SL2R mod SO2 can be identified with the upper half plane. And this is SL2C. So where uh, H is the upper half plane. All right. So you have an identification of points here inside the fundamental domain for the full maximum complex of, uh, inside the, the usual, uh, this picture, okay? So once you have a point here, you can, you can identify it with some point here. Okay, that's what is happening. So explicitly, if I want to see what this, this map is, uh, you can write X plus IY as a Levy decomposition as uh, you translate by X. So translation is done by the unipotent radical. And then this is Y to the half, Y to the minus half. And then the K part is just cosine theta, sine theta. applied to the identity using the fractional linear transformation. So K does nothing to it. And then you apply these matrices here, you get the point X plus I, Y, okay? So that's the explicit relation from here to here. Are you following? All right. So uh, now let's see what the map H0 is. H, there are two parabolics, HP and H0. So for, uh, sorry, HG and H0. HG, there is nothing to discuss because AG is trivial. So that map is trivial. On the other hand, HP, you have an honest map here. Uh, that is a log map, so let's see what that map is. So H0 is the map from GA to A0. And uh, A0, you can think of it as spanned by beta 1 check or pi one check. Depending on what we want to deal with, we'll use which, among the two bases, whichever we want, we can use. And so explicitly, if I see H0 of uh, an element G, I want to know what its value is here, so I take the dual basis, beta one, and this is log mod beta one of G. Oh, sorry. Uh, beta 1, H0 of G. So this is beta 1. So let's say G is uh, written as that, the expansion there. So uh, this is beta 1 of, uh, sorry, this is, it depends only on the M part. And the M part is uh, X to the half, X to the, Y to the half, yeah, y to the negative half. This is nothing but a log mod y. Okay, so in other words, you can think of H0 of G as log mod y times the dual basis of beta 1, which is pi 1 check. Okay, so not much, nothing deep is happening here. So. Okay. 
So now uh, let us analyze the term, uh, the non-trivial term here for SL2. So what is this? This is some characteristic function of some cone. Let's see what that cone is. Uh, So consider tau zero is zero delta x and it's t. So what does this mean? Uh, so delta is uh, in p uh, up to p zero element. It is uh, g q. So if I want to look at the image of delta x inside uh, the fundamental domain, then it's the same as the image of x. inside the fundamental domain. So let's just look at the what happens to x. So replace delta x with x. And uh, so yeah, so uh, tau 0. OK, let me, let me analyze this. There's not much difference. There's only a scaling, because this is the term I want to analyze. There's a hat here. So let me put the hat here. So tau 0 hat is the characteristic function of the set t in A0 uh, hat, so delta hat. So phi of t has to be greater than 0, phi in delta 0 hat. And uh, for SL2, this is nothing but uh, phi 1. So I want that uh, pi 1 of t should be positive. And so I, I choose the basis of t as t1 uh, or uh, t or t, yeah, t beta 1. Pi 1, so beta 1 check. So write this uh, as the basis. And then uh, if you just evaluate this, what, what are you going to get? So pi 1 of h0x minus t equal to 1. This is equivalent to uh, pi 1 h 0 x. Uh, so it's greater than 0. And pi 1 of t is just little t 1 t. So and if you evaluate this, then you get a uh, log mod phi 1 of x greater than t. And so here, I, I mean, there, there are two x's. It's actually, uh, this x is an element in the group, but I, the x plus i y is the element in the upper half plane. So uh, you have to be a little careful. Uh, but or I can write g here as the element of the group. But what, I, what I'm saying here is, uh, if I write, this x, sorry, ah, it was g, okay, I wrote, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, okay, this is g actually, yeah, thank you. So, if I write g here, then I can identify g with the x plus i, y. I want to know the condition on this x plus i, y, so that uh, I'm inside this cone, the cone, and the condition is that uh, if you just evaluate this, pi 1 g, so pi 1, uh, y to the half, y to the minus half, and then you get uh, y has to be greater than e to the t. Okay. So if you look at the real line here, this is the line a naught. This is the origin in a naught. Then if I want this to be one, that means I'm uh, I'm at so suppose this is e to the t then these are the points that I'm looking at, OK? Are you with me? So, uh, so this term here corresponds to this part, and the other term here corresponds to this part, OK? So when I, when I take the difference, I'm just looking at this part. Are you following? 
uh, okay. And if you look at the if you look at the SL2 picture, then what I'm saying is uh, there is e to the t here, and this is this part corresponds to p equal to g, and this part corresponds to p equals to p naught. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So so the point is that the fundamental domain for SL2 is partitioned into two parts, and two is the number of uh, standard parabolic subgroups. Okay, so, and this is the typical case, that uh, your fundamental domain is partitioned into uh, uh, disjoint equivalence classes given by the standard parabolic subgroups. So, uh, yeah, I erased the formula for KT, but this is, this is typical, okay? For every standard parabolic sub, you're, you're, it's an alternating sum, the truncated kernel, is an alternating sum over the parabolic subgroup. So that is what is happening. Okay. Uh, so now actually I have the, I, I had the choice of assuming this convergence theorem of the truncated kernel and just going on to the geometric side but uh, there are advantages of discussing the proof of uh, the truncated, uh, the absolute convergence of this truncated kernel. One thing is that uh, if you look at the geometric expansion, then it is, uh, if you are familiar with this expression, the, the, the things that are going on in, uh, in the proof, then it is easier to understand the uh, geometric side somewhat. There is a lot of combinatorics happening. Not much is reflected inside SL2 because SL2 is like squeezed, okay? But uh, if you look at higher rank groups, then there's a lot of combinatorics. There is uh, the Ziegel domain and uh, the langlands arthur combinatorial identities. I want to give a feel of this. So we will somewhat restrict, uh, we, we won't restrict to SL2, but a little bit I will talk about those things in general. And uh, another advantage of this proof is that uh, in the setting of beyond endoscopy, you want to extend the trace formula to not necessarily compactly supported functions. And so uh, the proof, so Finis and Lapid have this theorem that they expand uh, the geometric side to more broader class of test functions. And in that, they analyze uh, this proof and they, they modify this proof of the absolute convergence to get the uh, geometric side. So I will go into some amount of details, a little bit more than maybe I should, okay? so. Okay, so let, let's see. So this is the discussion on proof of. So this theorem 6.1, it says that the truncated kernel, if you integrate that, it converges absolutely. So, uh, so first thing is uh, the, the definition of a Ziegel set. So suppose uh, T is in A naught and omega is a compact subgroup of N0 A, N0 A1. compact subset, not subgroup. Then uh, this set, S, G, T, omega, given by uh, X, you write X as P, A, K. P is in omega, A is in A naught, and uh, K is in K. And further, there is a condition on A, the tau naught of H zero A minus T has to be equal to one. So A has to lie in some cone. So this set is called the Ziegel set attached to T and omega. And uh, the use of this theorem is 
the, uh, this definition is the theorem of Borel and Harishandra, which says that whatever happens here for the case of SL2 happens in general. That is, you have a fundamental domain. Okay. So let me write that theorem. So it says that you can choose T and omega wisely. So that you get a GA is GQ times the fundamental domain. Yeah, so this is what it says. So if you look at GA mod GQ, then uh, this fundamental domain, it, it subjects onto the fundamental domain in some sense, yeah. So let's see what, uh, le let's recover this fundamental domain in the case of SL2. So for SL2, uh, N0A is uh, a unipotent matrices, so 1, X, 0, 1, X in A, and uh, M0A is T, T inverse. And if you decompose M0A as M0A1 times the uh, AA naught, then this is nothing but uh, the norm on the edels. Okay, so the norm map, so this is exactly, I mean, uh, Take norm one elements t here, and then the norm is here. That's that's the same thing. Okay, so this is m zero a. So if I want to look at m zero a one times n zero a, that is the, my omega should be inside this, and k is just our so two. So if I write my element a, so x or g. Uh, so g I can write as p a k. P is in omega, A is in A naught, K is in K, such that I want to cover the full uh, SL2 A mod SL2 Q. So in that case, I have to have uh, this condition. So I have to choose T efficiently so that I cover everything. And choose T and omega. So, uh, so suppose T is, or uh, did I write T or T1? Yeah, let me write T1 here. Or, or let me write TG. Actually, that dependence on G. Choose TG. Because I will choose one TG and fix it throughout. So suppose TG looks like TG. Uh, this is the real number. And phi 1 check. Then I evaluate this here. So tau 0 of H0A and A can be written as uh, TT inverse minus TG equals 1. So what does this translate into? So T0 is uh, spanned by, uh, so for T0, you have to look at the set delta 0, which in our case is beta 1. Check, beta one. And so I want that beta 1 of this has to be positive. which means that uh, log mod y has to be greater than beta 1 of tg, which is little tg. Our tg has to be such that it has to be less than log mod y. Uh, the offshot here is that I, I, I have to, to choose this tg, and I have to choose this omega such that I cover the fundamental domain. Now, if you look at the action of an element here on the i, it's just translation, okay, n0 acts by translation. So I want to keep the width greater than the width of this, which is 1, and I want to have tg small enough that it, it uh, for every y, it, it has to uh, go below the minimum value of y, whatever. So 
this minimum value is half. So I have to choose log of half, some negative number. So I have to choose Pg. So the fundamental domain is going to be this. Okay, so this is Tg. This y coordinate is Tg. And this is omega. Are you following? Sorry, what? what? Uh, square root of 2, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is square root 3 divided by 2, yeah. Yeah, uh, right, right, yeah, of course, yeah. Well, I mean, that, it exists, yeah, so Tg. <laughs> so, so you can choose it well below, and you can choose omega to have width greater than 1, so you end up covering the full fundamental domain. That, that's the essence of the lemma. Now, uh, sorry, what, what is the question? Yeah, this k, yeah. If that's a bit smaller, uh, no, you, your k is maximal compact subgroup. It has to be the maximal compact subgroup, yeah. Otherwise, there's no, uh, you have to have G A as P zero A times K. For this relation to hold, K has to be at every place, it has to be the maximal compact subgroup. And not all places you can choose. There is some, for every place you have to do some work and choose this K. So you end up with the full maximal compact subgroup. So yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So now I fix this TG, I mean this capital TG throughout and this omega so that this works. And now uh, I will define the truncated Ziegel set. So it's just like you have these two terms here, you want to do it more generally. So I will define the truncated Ziegel set. Uh, So now you have fixed Tg and omega. Now you for uh, for uh, T in A0, uh, you define this Sg T and you have fixed Tg and omega as the set of x in A Sg, your full Siegel set such that phi of h zero x minus t has to be greater than zero. And all phi in delta zero hat. So the other one in the definition of the Ziegel set, you had the roots here. Now you have the co uh, weights here. Uh, so in the case of SL two, uh, if you if you just were, in the case of SL two, it's really simple because uh, the roots and root and weight are linear multiples of each other, you are in one dimension. So for SL2, you have that, uh, so X plus IY belongs to SG T1, sorry, T, TG omega, if and only if, if you write T equals uh, T beta one, check, because I want to evaluate a pi one check. So then the condition is that uh, y has to be greater than, le less than e to the t, 2t. Two t. And this t is the same as this t. So what I'm saying here is that if you look at that picture over there, then this thing is the full Siegel set, and the truncated Siegel set is where you 
truncated at e to the 2t. What is that? e to the 2t. So this is the truncated Seeger set. So this is the picture here, okay? Thank you. All right, so now you, the, the point of defining this is to give the partition lemma of Langlands, which says that there is a disjoint decomposition. Like, uh, so so let, let me state the partition lemma, or let, let me uh, define more general Ziegel set with respect to uh, a standard parabolic. So Arthur's notation is always consistent. So if you, if you keep reading, uh, when he writes something at the bottom and when he writes something at the top, the bottom part is contained in the top part and these are all very uh, smooth and consistent and very nice. So you, he writes the truncate, uh, so more generally, if you have P, standard parabolic, then you do this full business, whatever we did, inside the Levy subgroup of P. Instead of G, you take the Levy subgroup. So the whole, everything is like induct, big induction. His proof of the endoscopic classification is also a massive induction of, uh, so you do, you do for the Levy and it's, it's uh, okay. So what I'm saying is you define S, P, T, T, P, omega, or uh, these all, these, you just replace this, you put a P here, that, that's the point. So uh, SP, uh, define this by replacing delta zero, delta zero hat, with delta zero p, delta zero p hat. And you can think of this, everything is happening inside the Levy subgroup of p. So, uh, and also you, you, you define this function f g of x t is the image of the truncated Ziegel set. inside GA mod GQ. And analogously, define FP XT as well. Happening inside MP, the Levy subgroup of P. And if you, in this setting, then you have the partition lemma that says that your fundamental domain is partitioned according to standard parabolic subgroups. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is the, the X here. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a characteristic function. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so characteristic function in X of the image. Is, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so now the partition lemma says that if you sum this P over standard parabolics, and delta in GQ mod PQ. Of this FP of delta XT, tau P, HP delta X minus T, then this is equal to one. And these both these functions are either zero or one. 
okay yeah i i'm ignoring that i mean i'm just ignoring this here also i mean, you can you have fixed this tg and omega and then you just don't there's already enough symbols on the board so i just so, yeah so uh if you look at this you get one this is either 0 or 1 this is either 0 or 1 so to get one you have to have for what, what is this you don't yeah so for p not you get few terms equal to 1 and for p equal p equal to g you get few terms and that is exact this statement is exactly the fact that this full fundamental domain is a union of this part and the top part okay that is the content of this lemma yeah there is some subtle things but uh, gm uh, sorry what, what is the question Uh, no, it's defined on mod, I think it will be mod PQ, GA mod PQ or something, yeah. Okay, now, uh, we cannot use this lemma as it is directly, but we have to make a little modification for this. And the modification is that, uh, sorry, uh, uh, actually, uh, sorry, this is, a, this is something wrong, okay. This is FG here. And then I, I will do the same thing for, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 FP. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So now uh, the modification of this, and with this we will, the, we will not use this lemma directly, but we'll modify it for Levi subgroups and then use this lemma. And that says that uh, you can think of everything happening inside M the Levi subgroup P. So now replace P with P1. Uh, so, so in this setting, P1 is contained in P. Then you have P mod P1 is P1 intersect MP, NP mod MP, NP. And this is P1 intersect MP, MP. And so set tau P1, P as tau P1 intersect MP, tau P1, P hat, tau hat of P1 intersect MP. So think of everything as happening inside MP. And then the same lemma, it, it says that if you sum over P1 such that P0 is contained in P1, P. Oh, so there's a double sum. Of the same thing, FP1, delta X, T, tau P1, P, HP1 delta X minus T equals one. So this is the same. This is the same thing as this, except everything is happening inside the P, the Levy subgroup of P. Okay. So if you replace P with G, you will recover this. All right. So now this expression being equal to one, you substitute in the definition of the kernel, the truncated kernel. So you have KT XF as a sum over standard parabolics. Actually, I have not defined this AG when I when I define this. Uh, so AG is dimension of the Lie algebra AG. AP is the dimension of AP. And this is a sum over delta. Uh, 
kp delta x delta x. Now we had hp delta x minus d. This is just the definition. And then I, I can write a one here. And in place of this one, I write this expansion here. Okay. So this will be a sum over P. sum over delta and then sum over p1 and sum over delta 1. Now there will be four terms, kp, I'll just, I'll just write those terms, tau p hat, tau p1 p and uh, fp1. Uh, actually, sorry. Let me let me write those. Kp uh, Kp will have delta x delta x. Tau p hat will have delta x. Now I want to combine the sum over delta and delta one. So f p one delta one delta x p tau p one p. Okay, this. Now I can combine the sum over delta in GQ mod PQ and delta 1 in PQ mod P1Q and as a sum over GQ mod P1Q, but for that I have to be careful. I have to make sure that KP is invariant on the left by P1Q, which it is. And also I have to ensure that HP1 is left invariant under delta 1, which also it is. Okay, so that, that justifies that I can combine this sum over this and just write one sum. So this is sum over P containing P1. of uh, these four terms. So Kp Okay, so now I Look at this term here. They are, these are again zero or one. These are just characteristic functions of some cones. And uh, set H, I will just ignore, so H1, I will write as H P1. The argument of the function, I will just shorthand for this. Now I claim that tau P1 P, tau P hat, is a sum over P2 and Q of this minus 1 to the AP2 minus AQ tau P1Q tau Q hat. To see why this is true, I will break down this, this double sum over P2 and Q as the following. So, actually this statement is a kind of one line proof, but it's not so, I mean, it's not easy for me to see at least why it's, I mean, it's, this is tricky, but yeah. So if you stare at the RHS, you can write it as a sum over Q of the sum over P2 such that uh, P2 is squeezed between P1 and Q. 
this minus 1 to the AP2 minus AQ of tau P1Q tau Q hat. Now just look at the term, the alternating sign sum inside. Uh, it used the binomial theorem. So here this is nothing but minus 1 to the, if you have T subset of S, this looks like an alternating sum over. This is just binomial expansion, okay? And the value of this is zero if S is non-empty and one if S is empty. Sorry, can you please? The sum is over P2 squeezed in between P1 and Q. No, I'm fixing P1. The bottom P1 is fixed. The right hand side does not depend. There's, is there a P here? No, there's no P. Q has to be P1. Right. Sorry, I, I, I mean. So when when is this non-zero? Let, let's see if I have written anything wrong. This is non-zero precisely when p1 equal to p2, p1 equal to q. There's nothing here, right? And so if ah, you, you caught my mistake. Yeah. So what is the yeah, 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 you're right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So if P equal to Q, then I will have this sum over Q will be just P. And in that case, I will get this term here. Is that okay? Yeah, so P equal to Q is the only time I will get something non-zero out of he here. And in that case, when p equal to q, the sum over q is just p. When I plug in p here, I get the right-hand side. That is the thing. OK? Uh, so, so Arthur, now what do, does is equal to LHS. Now, what Arthur does is uh, replace the sum over p2 and q. So he calls sigma p1, p2 as the sum over q of this uh, minus 1 to the a p2 minus a q tau p1 q of h1 tau q hat of h1 and prove some properties about this function. The first most important property is that it's either 0 or 1 again. Okay? And he explicitly tells how the cone which defines this characteristic function of uh, the cone that this is a characteristic function of some cone. He gives the equations of that. And so the, the lemma is sigma p1, p2, this function defined like this, has takes values 0 and 1. And he tells explicitly when. And uh, the second part to the, so this is this, the fact that this is 0 or 1 and when it is 0 and 1, these are known as Langland's combinatorial identities. And this plays some combinatorial role, like if you, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just uh, not not tell about that. But this is known as Langlands Arthur. Combinatorial identities. Okay, so this is the first thing. And the second thing is, if a sigma p1, p2 is 1, then so is tau p1, p2. And uh, if, uh, so if you write this element h1 as h12 direct sum uh, plus h2 inside a p1, p2 direct sum a p2, then this h2 has norm bounded by a constant times h12. Uh, C is some positive number, depending on P on P. 
Now, uh, I wanted to, uh, the, the whole thing, I mean, when Arthur does the proof of this theorem and he applies this to analyze these terms here, KP and the, these things, one, one thing I, I observed is that Arthur says that this integral is compactly supported. I mean, uh, so the, what he wants to prove is that this expression, when integrated over GA1 mod GQ, gives something finite. So he breaks this integral over x as over p, a, and k. Okay, and the a part, he further breaks into an integral over this and integral over this. Now he says that this part here, the integral over h2, is compactly supported, but I don't see why. Uh, because if you look at the picture for SL3, I don't know. But it doesn't, the proof doesn't depend on it. You, the proof only depends on, I mean, I tried to go through the Duke paper and in the past, but actually uh, only this inequality says that you can reduce it to the integral over this. So that was one point I, uh, I, I thought might be tricky or something. But uh, yeah, so this is one comment I want to make. Uh, I'm kind of running out of time. I mean, I don't want to continue the proof in the next time. I want to start with the geometric side. I, uh, so let me briefly talk about the proof instead of writing a lot of things. So when you plug in this, if you want to analyze this, this term here, tau p, p1, p tau p hat, is nothing but uh, this basis here. So if you write here, if you replace it by this sigma p1, p2, uh, the sum over sigma, uh, you get something that looks like this. So KTXF is a sum over P1 and P2. Of the sum over delta, uh, you have FP delta XT, KP1, P2, delta X, and sigma p1, p2 of h1. So this is 0 or 1. This is 0 or 1. And the k p1, p2 is defined as an alternating sum over p squeezed between p1 and p2 minus 1 to the ap minus ag of k p x comma y or delta x delta x. So this is zero or one, this is zero or one. So you want to bother, you are, you are concerned only when this is one as well as this is one. So in that, when, when these two are one, then there is some reduction uh, that Arthur says, you can reduce the integral over the unipotent radical in a, over, over a smaller, smaller subset of the unipotent radical. Uh, and there is some cancellation happening there. So the, the alternating sum cancellation occurs in, in this point. Uh, actually, I, I don't have much time, so and I don't think there is value also uh, in going over these details. But uh, yeah, let me uh, give two important properties of the function JT, and then I will stop there. So the JT is defined as the integral of KT. So the first thing is uh, that if f is uh, if f is compactly supported in G A, then uh, and t is sufficiently regular, then t going to J T f is a polynomial in T. If you look at the proof of why there's a polynomial for, for example, SL3, then the point T is this, and you fix Tg here. And then uh, the proof of 
why this is a polynomial and why the degrees uh, with degree less than or equal to dimension of uh, a0 minus dimension of ag. This, uh, if you find the area of this polygon in terms of the coordinates of t, then you get exactly uh, a polynomial in this. And for, for SL2, it's just one degree polynomial. So uh, this is one. And the second thing is, uh, yeah, so, so as I mentioned, since it's a polynomial, it's defined over all values of t. And you pick the unique value of t, which makes your expression for jt independent of the minimal parabolic inside the fixed minimal levy. So choose, uh, sorry, there is a unique t, t naught in A naught such that j t naught of f is independent of uh, p naught in p of m naught where this is the set of standard, uh, pa not standard, parabolic subgroups sharing this levy m naught. And the second property is the invariance under conjugation of f by an element of g. So define a distribution to be invariant. If uh, it takes the same values at a function and it's uh, fy, so fy of x, f of x, y, x, y inverse. If you conjugate, you, you, you have to have the same distribution for all y in g. And uh, this j is not invariant, but you have the following formula. So Arthur defines a map c infinity c g a to every levy c infinity c m a f going to f q y and q is n m so this is this m is the same as this and uh, he gives an expression j t of f y as a sum over uh, q standard parabolics of j m q f q y so although this distribution JT is not invariant, it satisfies this, this formula. And so I'm not defining the function FQY, but it's a natural way of going from the function on the group to function on the Levy subgroup by integrating over the unipotent radical. And there's a, there's a canonical way to do this. And uh, uh, this is the formula for the invariance. Okay, uh, I will stop here. And sorry for being a little bit late.